So we are now at my family home. I've spent many years sort of here, living here on and off between my travels and just going to show you some photos. In here I've got a big photo wall. There's my dad and me and Taria. Um, there's me at the top, little baby Esty. Dad reading us a Christmas story. We all look a bit old for stories. Um, and my dad with some rocking hair. This is a great shot of Harriet when she was younger. <laughs> Pretty classy. Oh, that's uh, my parents' wedding day. That's, that's a lovely photo of Harriet and I. Me, once again, with a really bad haircut and like really bad fashion. Really bad necklace over skivvy look. That, that photo we've just tried to destroy and it keeps just turning up. first memory of Esther was um, like her getting out of bed and crawling into my bed. So my parents' answer to that was they put a door on the top of the cot to um, uh, make her stay in her cot. So I don't think they get away with that nowadays. I think there'd be notifications. She was, I think, one of the most lovable children, not just in our family, we all adored her. But Esther was always very um, naturally smart at school. She was the sort of little sister. She was quiet, obliging, generally very even-tempered. She had to, I suppose, cope with the elder sister who sometimes, well, was, had a dominant personality, was much more out there. Yes. Knock, knock. Who's there? I. I see. Move it the rest. I've got a good mind not to tell you. You've got a good mind not to tell me. Esther was much more um, quiet. She seemed to fall into line with Harriet. No evidence at all of any sort of issues of uh, emotional instability or anything like that. Very um, obliging and very even-tempered. Didn't normally sort of, um, you know, create a problem. Just the easiest, most beautiful little girl to bring up and that's why it was so heartbreaking when things changed. The way I see bipolar is almost like it's like the entire gamut of human experience wrapped up into an illness. Characterised by periods of mania and periods of depression and then periods of stability. When she turned 13, uh, I noticed personality changes. I think like, probably things were happening you know, that we weren't fully aware of and maybe patterns were being established. I definitely noticed a change in myself just in my attitude and my behaviour. Girls were very, very different, uh, different in personality and um, different emotionally. My relationship with Harriet um, changed when I became a teenager. I sort of got fed up because she sort of bossed me around quite a bit when I was young. She's got quite a strong personality and I had quite a timid personality. That sort of worked for us and then I became quite rebellious and I told her to F off, you know. She got angry, suddenly it went to a whole level of like psycho. It was like World War Three around the house. It was a nightmare. But we were still close, I was super close. Um, she just chilled out a bit and stopped telling me what to do and getting her to, getting me to make her food and stuff like that and doing things for her. I don't think there was anything really extreme um, in her behaviour. The others were actually sort of creating mayhem. Like Jane was jumping out windows and going off to see her boyfriend and Harriet was always sort of, you know, fairly sort of you know, boisterous. I don't think I would have ever considered that I was bipolar, but um, I did start seeing a psychologist when I was 16. I did feel funny, you know, for the first few days, going on medication can feel funny. So there's a definite link between mental illness and substance abuse. About 50% of people suffering from bipolar abuse, drugs or alcohol or both. There's various reasons, but a lot of it's down to self-medication. It's not really a surprise that that's what I eventually sort of turned to, particularly when I wasn't um, diagnosed People might not recognise that someone has a mental health issue. They can just put it down to, oh, they're an alcoholic or, oh, they've got drug and alcohol issues. Yeah, I definitely self-medicated, obviously. I ended up in rehab. And that was really good for me um, because, you know, obviously you can't drink and it was a bit of therapy and uh, it did help to see, you know, other people's addictions and how they had dealt with them. And being in rehab, being sober. And also 
gave me the opportunity to live like while on medication and to start getting well because most medication doesn't really work when you're mixing it with a whole lot of alcohol. We all started to realise that when she stopped drinking she had these issues that pop up still so we realised it was like a mental illness. It's put my journey backwards a little bit with bipolar because um, if I was just concentrating on dealing with and coming to terms with being bipolar then I would have probably started doing that four years ago but because I was coming to terms with being an alcoholic that consumed me so now I think I'm coming to terms with the bipolar diagnosis and even though I was relieved when I heard it still it's hard to accept that there's you know something kind of wrong with your mind um, because you, you know you don't want to you have to sort of grieve your healthy self a little bit and it's a process and it takes time and you know accepting that you'll always have to be on medication and I think it took a while for us to mum was like oh god you can't be on this lithium tablets and um you know dad probably didn't take it necessarily didn't really accept it until the incident so I you know got the call short story Esther broken out of flinders drinking down quick sticks Ordered herself a couple of drinks Ordered herself a couple more went to get her because she was on these very heavy medications and it had a much more potent effect. Got to the hospital and that's when her eyes rolled back in her head and I was like, she's not breathing. And she was basically comatose on the floor, sort of clinically dead for a while. That's the one time I ever experienced being in shock. It was the scariest thing in the whole world. I think that, <clears throat> in a sense, was very traumatic for everyone but Esther. You know, I was not the one that was present for that moment. I was completely not present. We didn't know that she didn't have brain damage for the whole night until I spoke to her the next day and she'd forgotten all about it. She thought she'd just gone down to quick sticks, had a few drinks and then she was just back in her room and I said, did you wonder why there was an armed guard sitting across from you? And she was like, I did wonder that. You know, my sister and my dad in particular, in particular had to sort of witness um, me going into a coma and um, having to be resuscitated, you know, in an emergency room. That was probably the best thing that happened. She realised how bad it could actually be. I think it's affected their lives quite a lot, especially in the last few years. I think they were very concerned um, about my health and my well-being. I'm probably not the best at trying to imagine what she goes through on an everyday, day-to-day -day lifestyle thing, because I think it's a bit too much for me to have to, like, do with. So I probably should do that a little bit more. But, yeah. <laughs> In the sort of grip of mania or, or unclear thinking, you know, things can be said, you know, that are quite hurtful. She's got these different personas each time and one is my best friend and the person that I, um, you know, could spend all my time with and who makes me laugh more than anything and the other is the most annoying person in the whole world. So that's why we fight and I can't have her living with me and she's the most annoying person in the whole world. <laughs> In rehab, you know, I experienced people whose family weren't even allowed to visit because they, they were users or they were using, or they just weren't there. So I'm really very lucky. Mental health care is a holistic process. You can't just care for someone's symptoms uh, medically. You need to look at their housing, you need to look at their recreation, their family life, their social life all the different facets of what makes up a person because all of these things can impact upon someone's mental health. Because it's not who they are, it's her illness that changes her. So she's still that amazing little sister that I had. She just has to deal with something. I think a little bit of relief as well with my family that I had been diagnosed because I had so many other issues surrounding what they thought was alcohol abuse, um, which it was. It sort of gave us some sort of hope that there might be a solution to that problem. I accepted it quite quickly. I was fortunate that one of my closest friends um, I knew was bipolar and she'd been diagnosed about seven years or six years earlier than me um, and she was really open about it. I was 22 when I was diagnosed with bipolar. Basically my head just exploded and I ended up in um, the Kylo Centre in the Prince of Wales Hospital for about a month um, and I experienced a psychotic episode um, through that time and then was diagnosed and put on to um, lithium and an antipsychotic and um, had all sorts of amazing 
experiences in the hospital and uh, wrote a play about it. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, so I'm just going into my friend Nina's shed and where I keep a, like, a lot of my stuff that's been in storage when I've been travelling. I never suspected Esther had bipolar. My experience of bipolar was more the kind of manic episode type of bipolar or the depressive episode. And I didn't ever see that um, from Esther. This is my old diary. She came to me and said that she had been diagnosed with bipolar and it actually surprised me a little bit because Esther presents very well. 94. Mm. Welcome, so, no. welcome to my diary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's not read everything. <laughs> oh my god it's got a contents page. Mm. For me she always can behave as though everything's totally fine even when she's in her worst crisis. I think this is partly why mental illness can become so misunderstood. Cute. Look at my handwriting. It's very, it's quite neat. Yeah, that's pretty neat. You know, depression for one person might look completely different or mania for one person might look completely different. It's really sometimes hard to tell what's what. Well, let's not look at that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. People like me that are open and my friend Nina really like, help people that may be suffering from similar things. If we were all a bit more educated just around signs and symptoms. The stigma is stopping people from getting well and getting well sooner. Potentially causing people to suffer in silence and then take their own lives. If you can pick up when a friend might be in a spot of trouble, you can sort of check in with that person and just like make sure they're okay. If people can see that, you know, a normal person that's not a complete psychopath and not for like half an hour anyway or you know <laughs> five minutes that's the face of mental illness it can be anyone you know it can be someone that you don't expect and for it to be just this unknowable like thing unspoken thing you know it's um it's not helping anyone it's all very well to say you can put yourself in another person's shoes. That's something I think I do naturally is put myself in another person's shoes. And, but you're not that other person. <laughs> and Esther really remembers really things now which is really annoying. Well, it's not like a like... special gift or anything, it's just not being <laughs> drunk. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I was like, Lordy. yeah. At any time were you in denial about your alcohol dependency or in denial about being diagnosed with bipolar? Well, I was definitely in denial about my alcohol. <laughs> Should we leave that? Or? Yeah. <laughs> Silly child. <laughs> Quiet. <laughs>